first of all, it is a joy to formally meet you. I know we've ran in the same circles for quite some time now. And so we've heard each other speak and um, I've known about you. And so when you contacted me, I was absolutely delighted to talk about mast cell activation today because so many of you out there listening, I know if you've dealt with Lyme or mold or other infections, we'll talk about all that today and some other causes of mast cell. But Beth is really an expert in this area. And in just a few minutes, we'll dive into her story and a little bit of her background and you know what got her interested in this because we all have a story. Um, so thanks for joining us today. Just a little bit of background information. If you haven't seen our YouTube channel, it's just under Jill Carnahan. It's all free. Would love for you to subscribe there. You can get this video um, in just a day or two. It will be live there to share. Um, and then all kinds of other free resources and videos are on the YouTube channel. Um, my regular website is just jillcarnahan.com. Lots of free um, blog resources there as well. So if you want to know more about that, um, and then your website, Beth, is at masscell360.com. Is that correct? That's it, yeah. Okay, and we'll be sure and include that link. So let me introduce you, Beth, and then we'll jump right in. So Beth O'Hare is a functional naturopath specializing in complex chronic immune conditions related to mast cell activation syndrome and histamine intolerance. She's a founder and owner of Mast Cell 360 a functional naturopathic practice designed to look for all factors surrounding health conditions, genetic, epigenetic, biochemical, physiological, environmental, and emotional. I, I love that, Beth, because this is a complex thing. And so you have to, like Bob Miller, a co friend of ours, he's background electrical circuits and all that, and I'm background engineering, and you must have a little bit of that in you because it's complex, right? <laughs> Um, her subspecialties are mold toxicity and genetic analysis in the area of mast cell activation and histamine intolerance. So we will um, totally dive into that today. So any of you listening that have had mold exposure or concerns about that, that is definitely one of the big triggers. We'll talk all about that in just a little bit. Um, I won't read all of this, but she is just a real, real expert. And we are so delighted to have you here, Beth. So thank you for joining me today. Oh, thank you so much, Jill. And I'm just really grateful that we can partner and support each other to get this information out because it's hard to find this kind of information that that you put out and that we put out and so i think we can do a lot for people especially in this area mm -hmm. because it's so under recognized but the demographics show that anywhere from nine to 17 percent of the general population have mass cell activation syndrome so it's like one in ten at least and then the chronically ill population, it's above 50%. So this is a huge, huge area that needs attention. Well, and I, I love that because what happens is there's so many silos in conventional medicine. There's a rheumatologist, there's a gastroenterologist, there's a neurologist, there's the et cetera, et cetera, allergist. And everybody has a little tiny area of blinders and they're looking at, okay, you have leaky gut, intestinal permeability, you have Crohn's or colitis or whatever issues. Then you go over here and you have arthritis and osteoarthritis, or you have a lupus. And then you over here and you have um, maybe early signs of MS. And really at the core, mast cell activation can affect every system. Can can it. Um, I want to talk about symptoms, but first, let's tell me about your story. Like, how did you get interested in mast cells and such a, a unique area that's so important? Well, you know, as a child, um, I remember I was thinking about this, you know, thinking about doing this today. And I was remembering that when I was six, we had to choose what our career path would be. You know, it was like one of those little yes. recital yeah. things. And so I decided I was going to be a nurse. And I remember my mom saying, well, why wouldn't you be a doctor? And I didn't know any female doctors back then. You know, it wasn't, we didn't have role models and things like that. So she told, that was game changing for me. So I decided I was going to be a doctor. And I bring that up because I didn't just like casually decide, like I dedicated my life to that. And, but then we moved out to the country when I was seven to this old farmhouse. Yeah. And we didn't know anything about mold. But now we know it was totally full of toxic mold. It had a crawl space, the entire crawl space was black wow. from the mold. And my health just went downhill there. Um, I had horrible allergy symptoms. I'd had hives. I had exercise-induced asthma. I had bad GI issues to where every morning I would be running to the bathroom just mm -hmm. from like the stress of getting ready for, for school. Yeah. But I was still like so passionate about this and I did my undergrad in pre-med and by the time I got to my junior year I realized I was so sick there was no way I was going to make it 
I yeah. knew if I could make it through the four years of study, I would never do the 80 hour week residency because I was already crashing. So I had a full scholarship to med school and I had to turn it down, which was just devastating. And I became a chronically ill patient instead. And exactly what you were describing, I had an allergist, I had a GI person, I had a primary care, I saw a rheumatologist, I had all these misdiagnoses. I was um, even sent to a psychiatrist at one point, I was sent to counseling, I was told I was crazy, because I got incredibly sensitive to where if I just did a little sprinkle of curcumin, which should have helped the inflammation, I was just like, couldn't sit down anxious and couldn't sleep. And I was, by the time I was 28, I had to walk with a cane. Oh, so my friends were out dancing and having a great time. And I could barely hobble across the room to the bathroom because my joints felt like ground glass. And I wanted to give up because I had seen at one point over 50 different practitioners. And I saw the best functional medicine practitioner I could get access to before we had telemedicine. Mm-hmm. And I remember we worked together for two years. I tried everything he told me to try. And I remember him telling me, I don't know what else to do. We've oh. reached the end of the road. And I, I just cried the whole way home because it took me an hour to drive there. And it oh. took me three days to work up the energy. And it would take me three days to recover from that drive. Yeah. But I learned about histamine intolerance right around that time. And then there was a person, Yasmina Kellenstrom, who was yes. reporting about mast cell activation syndrome. And she literally saved my life. And we had this small community online of people that were like her first followers. So that's how I found out. Yeah. Oh, wow. It fit all the, like everything finally fit. And it was such a relief because I had started to think I was crazy. Because I didn't know anybody that was that sensitive and that was that sick, other than some people I had met online and Yasmina. So she kind of got me started. And then I got into the genetics and I started putting pieces together that, oh, I was overmethylated. I had significant glutamate variants. So that made sense with all the anxiety and trouble sleeping. And just piece by piece, I was doing like a tiny sprinkle of the gentlest things every third day, worked myself up, still didn't know anything about mold but started to get my health back. Then learned about mold and I had Lyme and Bartonella and Babesia. I grew up in the country and we got bit by chicks all the time. But everything finally started making sense and I got my life back and then I got to go back to graduate school. So I did, first thing I did was a master's in psychology and that's always been one of my loves and how really how our nervous system affects our immune system. So I did my research in that area on mast cell activation and then I went on and got a doctorate in functional naturopathy. So I didn't become the traditional neurologist that was my dream, but I got to come full circle in a different way. And I'm just so grateful to have my life back. I went hiking. I just did, I've been building up my aerobics and I just did like 130 beats a minute today on the treadmill for 15 minutes, which for me is huge for somebody who used to struggle to walk one block. Wow. Wow. Beth, I knew I liked you, but now I even love you more (laughs) with your story. I mean, I could almost cry hearing that because I had such a similar, I didn't know that I had MCAS or histamine, but farmhouse mold, cancer at 25. And I think about like getting through medical school in a way you were so blessed because I did try to do it and I got cancer through it because it was so hard. I remember like literally thinking, I don't know if I can do this, you know, it was so brutal and the hours and that, so you kind of saved yourself. (laughs) And I literally look back sometimes like, I don't know how I made it. I really, really don't. I really, truly don't except God has his hand on my life and like protected me and guided me. And and I know that it was his grace that allowed me to get through, but gosh, I have so much compassion for your story. It's not identical to mine, but I know suffering and I know that feeling of like, I have to find the answers because nobody out there really understands. I've been there. Right. right. And then feeling so alone. And yes. that's what drew me to you too, was I knew you had gone through this and just that courage to get through the, that darkness. And yeah. That's what drives me is I felt so alone mm-hmm. and I don't want people to have to feel alone going through this. And so I work with people that are just so, so sensitive 
yeah. but we can pull it together. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of work, but we can do it. And then people can actually live their lives and have fun with the kids and get to travel and all those things instead of just spending life on the couch. Yes. I love, and I love that you're here as a living example and me too. And it's still, I still have a bubble. I still have to be really careful what I do, how much I do. Um, so, and I'm sure you're the same. So I love that we're here talking to people listening out there that have maybe given up hope or been like so feeling isolated or sensitive. And, and there is hope. Like I used to travel uh, every other week, it seemed like, and that would have been a crazy um, imagination, you know, before when I wasn't feeling well. So the, it is possible. It is possible to get less sensitive. And yet we still have to be really, really careful, don't we? <laughs> I do. I still have to take my supplements. Yeah, I, me too. I will never eat. Fast food Me too. Again. I always say it's not like we're walking on a tightrope still and the slightest wind still bumps us off and we get back up and get on that tightrope. And that's just like we were, I feel like that's part of our calling is we are going to be, and you know, I just read some work on um, Elaine Aaron and the highly sensitive person. And it's about like the emotional sensitivity, but I realized, wow, a lot of these people, it's a full spectrum. It's this chemical environmental, their systems are overreactive. And on the other side of it, they actually have a gift of intuition and sensitivity to the human race and the compassion for suffering and that as well. So it's kind of this double-edged sword. Um, let's dive into like, what does it look like for people who might be out there and wondering if they have MCAS or histamine intolerance? Let's talk about kind of like, what, what would it look like? I know it's so variable, but give us a little bit of symptomatology kind of outline on what we might see for patients. Yeah, let's talk about the classic and then let's talk about what really happens. Okay. So the classic is going to be those allergic type symptoms, food allergies, hives, itching, watery eyes, flushing, congestion, these kinds of things. So people end up with an allergist. This is one of the places so many people are falling through the cracks because that those skin presentations only happen in a percentage of people with mast cell involvement. And unfortunately, a lot of allergists and immunologists have been educated to think that if you don't have flushing, itching hives, you can't have mast cell activation. I've had so many people come in and to my practice and say, hey, I was told that there's no way I could have this. But then they have all of the other pieces. So I have a person that she doesn't have the skin symptoms, she doesn't flush, but she has acid reflux, mm -hmm. she has diarrhea, she has sleep issues, she has anxiety. So there you've got the gut and the nervous system, the brain pieces, and then she gets trouble breathing. So it's like her chest gets tight with the wrong foods. Yeah. And then I have other people that have like the urinary burning, they have endometriosis, they've got big hormone imbalances, really painful periods, and that kind of it's that area that shows up for them. So we've got to be thinking about that in different areas. And I actually took the research on the symptoms that have been associated and put it together in a symptom survey for people. So if they want to find that, we have that on the website. Mm -hmm. And they can take a look and kind of score themselves on those and see if this might be in the ballpark for them. But you said it exactly earlier that it's two, two systems or more are where we have symptoms. And some people have eye symptoms. It's like their eyes get red and painful, or you know, they, they'll have the sinus swelling, they'll have ear issues and ear pain or ear ringing, sometimes respiratory. Low blood pressure, very common, but I have some people with high blood pressure mm -hmm. because of other issues. Hypermobility is associated, uh -huh. but it's not always. That's such a big one with mold yeah. right? because the mold toxins and Bartonella eat away at our connective tissue. So that the, what I tell people is think about, are you a mystery person? Are you falling through the cracks? Do you think you've been misdiagnosed? I was misdiagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, even though I didn't have any elevations on the autoimmune markers. They just said, well, that's got to be what it is with your joint pain. And then I had somebody wanted to do exploratory surgery on my knees. Oh. Walk. And I'm like, oh, not without a theory of what we're looking for. Yeah. But that's, this is kind of that common story of like, I've seen five people already or 10 people already. That's when I tell people to start to think about and it's sensitivity, sensitivities to chemicals, to foods, yep. to supplements. That's a classic. 
great overview and some of the things that came to mind that patients maybe have been told they have or they're mysterious that I think, and I want to check in with you on the mast cell, but interstitial cystitis, which is an inflammation of the bladder, there's a high histamine component with that. Um, you mentioned some of the other uh, female and hormonal symptoms, but what about uh, vulvodynia and the burning tongue? I think sometimes those can be histamine yeah. mast cell related. Is that right? I'm so glad you brought up the burning tongue and the burning mouth. That's mm -hmm. also really classic with mast cell. Not everybody has yeah. these. One of the things we have to remember is people are going to have like a subset. Mm -hmm. But on the vulvodynia and the interstitial cystitis, mm -hmm. there's this triad with that and fibromyalgia. And we often find at the core of that oxalates, which are those yes. little, I know you know, but for people who don't know what oxalates are, they're, they're little crystals in crystal structures in plants like sweet potatoes and spinach and rhubarb and chard and almonds, very high. And they're sharp like glass. And that's exactly what caused my joint pain. Uh, oxalates are a big muscle trigger and we know yeah. molds produce oxalates in our body. And mold is just the number one trigger I'm seeing in my practice. So I always think Beth, like you are like one in a million to put that together because there's so few people that understand just in case you didn't hear that I want to just review and then give it right back to you Beth. Basically mold will cause your body to produce more oxalates and some people have trouble breaking them down or if they're eating a lot of so there's a lot of different sources not just the mold but if you have aspergillus exposure or, or candida it will often make more oxalates and then if you have trouble breaking it down or you have too much um, food sources of oxalates. And like Beth said, these are sharp and jagged and they can cause pain anywhere in the body, but especially the vaginal pain, vulvodynia, burning for no reason, interstitial cystitis, which is bladder irritation. And then you mentioned the fibromyalgia, the chronic pain all over your body. Um, very, very common. So thanks for bringing that together yeah. because people have heard all the bits and pieces, but it is important to understand that mold is a big part of that. <laughs> and joint, joint pain, so they can yeah. lodge the joint so we think about oxalates and kidney stones, but mm -hmm. I've learned from Emily Givler at Tree of Life Health, who's an oxalate expert, that kidney stones are only 0.5% of oxalate issues. Wow. So kidney stones are actually rare in the oxalate mm -hmm. problems. And then those oxalates will trigger the mast cell activation. So it'll trigger that inflammation. So that's what we have with the interstitial cystitis, the burning. And I had all of that going on. Well, I already had mold. So the mold that colonized my body was producing oxalates. And then when I went gluten-free, which was the first thing I tried to do when I decided I had to work more holistically, I was replacing wheat with almond flour. I yes. was doing loads of sweet potatoes, lots of beets, lots of Swiss chard. And it was just, I, it really, that's why it felt like ground glass in my joints. And it was triggering all this mass activation. So that was one piece of the puzzle of this, multi-piece puzzle of putting it together. So good, such a good overview of symptoms. And again, there's many more. One thing you mentioned too that I thought is so interesting, a lot of patients I have, I shouldn't say a lot, but there's a small percentage of patients I have that just going into moldy building, the main symptom they'll get is heartburn. And I think that the connection there is probably the mast cell activation from the mold and triggering that reflux potentially. But it's kind of an unusual thing, but they're classic. They know every time they get into a moldy building, they have heartburn. And yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, I've heard you talk about um, chattagul... Uh, have yeah. With <laughs> that, no, yeah. Yeah, that, um, that you feel so sleepy. Yes. And I know right away because I start to get brain fogged and spacey and I just yeah. feel like I'm going to slide to the floor. So we were house hunting last year and we looked at over 50 houses and I could walk in and within a minute, I would be like, nope, turn around and walk out. And we found there was one house out of all of those we looked at that did not have mold. Unbelievable. I have a funny story too. I've been looking at new properties, just thinking about maybe expanding the clinic and we're probably not going to this year with COVID. But when I did this months ago, I would look to this old bank property and I went in there and looked around. It's beautiful. And then I left and I was going back to the office to do some charting and I wasn't seeing patients that day. So, but um, I got to the office and I like, I was so confused. I couldn't find my keys. I literally called from the parking lot up to the office and said, um, guys, I think I got a mold hit. I don't think it's a good idea for me to come in right now to help to do charts, <laughs> but it's that confusion and feeling like I, I don't even know where my keys are. I better not go do patient charting. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. And I think a lot of people have these mold sensitivities and we're not aware of it. So, so often I'll ask, and it's first thing I talk about with people is have you ever lived anywhere that was musty, anywhere there was crawl space, have you worked any place? where people were sick? Did you work in a school 
or I get kids in and the kids get so much exposure in the school. Yes. And people or else the schools, public buildings are horrendous. They're all flat roofs and they're usually not well maintained. So sadly, yeah. government buildings and schools are not the best for mold. And people think, they often tell me like, either they absolutely know or they absolutely think they don't have mold exposure. And they'll say, well, no, I've never had mold exposure. But we start digging in and it's just, it just fits. And so I think part of what's happening is the mast cells in the traditional medicine community are kind of getting a bad rap. And it's like, well, we've got to knock them down. If we do a lot of antihistamines, we'll calm it down. That'll handle the symptoms. And that's what happened with me. So by the time I was 12, I was on six different medications and it did calm my symptoms down and it made me more comfortable and I could function better. So I, cause I was like itching so bad. I was scratching my skin at night and bleeding and, and, um, but then what happened because those mast cells are like the frontline defenders of our immune system. So I think of them like the guards of the castle gate and they're there yeah. to keep bad things out and let the good things in. Well, if we put them to sleep, they can't keep the bad things out anymore. And then all the mold and the Lyme and the Bartonella babesia had free reign in my body. And I think that's why I got so, so sick. Yeah. So I think there's definitely a, time and a place for calming those mast cells down but then we've got to go what's happening underneath and that's how I got well was well what's really triggering it why yeah. are the mast cells on you know sounding the the alarm yeah and then what do we do listen to those mast cells and uh, deal with what's causing them to sound the alarms instead of just trying to knock them out of the equation so I love that let's talk next about triggers but just to reiterate what you said um, both of us love functional medicine. The reason is we don't just want to give a diagnostic code and then say, here's a med for that code or even five meds for that code for that, for that matter. Um, that might work for the short term, but the real healing comes from both of our lives and what we've been through and going deeper and saying what actually was the root cause and or causes. So let's talk just a little bit about Beth. We've talked about mold. Clearly mold is a big, maybe the biggest trigger to mast cell activation. Um, what are some of the other triggers that you see um, for mast cell activation? Well, definitely Lyme, and Lyme has become a big issue. Honestly, I think Lyme has become one of the reasons I think, and you probably have some ideas I would have thought of too. One of the reasons I think it's such a big issue is because the mold has become such a big issue. So when we get mold toxicity, it like knocks out our pathogen killing side of our immune system and then takes that chronic inflammatory side, which is the mast cell side up. And so we're in this, I can't kill off viruses and bacteria, and I'm really, really, really inflamed. So I do see quite a lot of mold and Lyme. And then one of the things I look at that I don't think a lot of people think about is airway. Mm -hmm. And we have this kind of generational lack of nutrition, which causes our dental arches to get smaller and smaller, which is why I have braces. Yeah. Because mine was so small, my tongue was falling back in my throat. And I felt anxious during the day and had all of this muscle tension because my body was just struggling to keep open. So it's been a game changer to get that widened. I don't tell people to do that in the beginning because it's not pleasant or fun. But sometimes that can help to make sure we have enough oxygen and sleep. It can help with sleep. Estrogen dominance is a big trigger. So estrogen triggers mast cells progesterone calms mast cells. So that's one of them that I often, often see. And food, I see a lot of food triggers, especially once the mast cells get dysregulated. Then we get this immune triggering of things like, I had food, immune IgGs to broccoli and flax seed. Like yeah. things, that, you know, it makes sense. Like, okay, corn, wheat, dairy, but broccoli and flax seed. So I had to stop eating those for six months and let that calm down. So those are some of the really big ones. My favorite one that we always underestimate is stress and trauma. Yes. And I found that about 60% of people in my practice have had early childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. and, a, and trauma can even be, can be that we've experienced abuse, but even witnessing. Mm -hmm. You know, if we, at six years old, we watch somebody die and we don't understand, or we see something terrible happen. I have, get people from different countries and they've lived through a war as a child. Um, and sometimes it's not even that severe. Sometimes it's having a surgery at 
five, six, seven years old, and we just don't understand what's happening. And then that affects our nervous system, immune system development. So that's why I have people start with nervous system rebalancing. And it's huge. Yeah, I really want to dive into that topic because I know you have some resources and so much knowledge on that. So love, love, love where you're going with this and all the important information you're bringing up because it really is this very broad spectrum and many, many, many triggers. And I, you didn't mention EMFs, electromagnetic frequency, but what I see yeah. is that like adds on to the burden, yeah. right? And not everybody, yeah. Go ahead. Solid research on that now. If there's any question at all, solid research. I have 20 studies on the website. On oh, wow. This, and this is all on your website too, you said, yeah. right? Okay. Oh, that's such a great resource for people. Um, and yet Lyme is becoming epidemic. Um, and so this toxic burden, I always say in a real simple way, if you've listened, you probably heard me say this before, but at the very core of functional medicine, besides looking for the root triggers, it's usually toxic load and infectious burden. And these two things create inflammation and create other things like mast cell activation. But at the core, Beth and I are usually looking for what toxic load might be there, like mold or chemicals or metals or EMFs, and what infections like old viruses that are reactivated, Lyme, Borrelia, Bartonella, Babesia, Ehrlichia, et cetera, all these tick-borne or, or um, lice-borne infections that can really wreak havoc on the body. So thanks for bringing that up. Let's talk a little bit about treatment. And I know you mentioned in our email before um, the, the call, like ordering things is important. So I'd love to know a little bit about how you like to address that in order, um, order of operations. So the first thing I do is, is the analysis to see, you know, what, what's this person dealing with? And then the first thing I actually recommend people do are nervous system supports. And this is because there's this axis, the psycho neuro endocrine immunological axis. So when, when I took classes, I don't know if this was the same for you in medical school, but we had, you know, here's the immune system, here's the nervous system. Psychology is on a whole different campus. And then we've got, you know, our endocrine our hormone system. But the truth is they're interwoven and we really need to be teaching them in terms of how they're all interwoven and signaling. So our mast cells react within seconds to our thoughts, to our stress. And I've done experiments on myself. So one of my first swellings, a, a big symptom, mast cell activation too. And that's one of my first symptoms. So I know I've gotten the wrong food or I'm in mold because my knuckles on my hands will start to swell. Ah. And my hands can go from looking like somebody in their forties to really looking like a, six, a 70 or 80 year old person's hands from the swelling. And I've done experiments where I've just started to spiral on something to see what would happen. And it, within two minutes, my hands will swell. It's wow. just like just immediate. And so I really studied this and did a whole thesis on this axis and mast cell activation. And it's critical. One of the stories I like to share is several years ago, I walked into a hotel. My husband and I were out traveling to see his son and his grandbaby. And we had rented this hotel. We walked in, put our bags down. I noticed that it smelled really strong in there. But I thought, well, it'll probably air it out. And we left, we went to dinner. Came back in, so I'd already had the first exposure. Second time in, I had this massive asthma attack. Oh. And I had not had asthma in years, so I didn't even carry a rescue. Yeah. And so I went to the front desk and like gasping, trying to get my words out, told her that I was, couldn't breathe. And she said they just shampooed the carpets in the hotel. Oh. So there was the fragrance from the cleaner and then all of the mold activation. Yeah. Oh. With all the spores and the toxins. Yes. <laughs> so I went to the car. My husband's like working with him to try to get us to another hotel. And I thought, I'm going to have to go to the ER. I don't want to go to the ER because then I'm going to have all the smells and these other yeah. triggers. All I had was breathing practices. And actually I had eucalyptus essential yeah. oil, which is okay for me, not for everybody, but okay for me. I, I breathed for 30 minutes and I consciously worked on calming oh. myself, telling myself I'm okay, positive self-talk. And I got that asthma attack to stop. And this was like an ER class. And I don't tell everybody to do no. that. <laughs> if you, need to, you need to go to the ER, but I know my body well enough to know. But that's the power of our thoughts and breathing and being able to manage our stress. 
Wow, I just had a thought. It sounds really me to tears of uh, when my little brother, so we both grew up on the same farm and he's nine years younger than me, but he had horrible asthma. No doubt there was mold and exposure. And of course, corn and beans were the, the crops and they're yeah. loaded with mold. So all of the dust and everything on our farm, I'm sure it was just a Petri dish of mold for me. Bottom line though, same with, thing with you, the going to a hotel, I remember when he was probably two or three and I was the older sister and he had a horrible asthma attack in this hotel. And I remember like sitting with him and breathing with him and like talking to him at, before my parents took him to the ER and, and he did, he was able to start to breathe a little bit better. But I remember like, I didn't know anything, but mom was just like, you know, talk to him and breathe and, and us talking together. And I think my mom was right there with us and that like what, until we can get the ambulance there, that breathing really did make a difference. Um, you know, and so it, it was like all that we could do right then, but it was pretty powerful. <laughs> like, I yeah. really remember that at a bit, when you talked about that at a visceral level, I'm like, I remember my little brother and I was afraid he was going to die. Oh, and gosh. You so were I <laughs> good to be able to do that. Well, I don't know. You know, I mean, my mom was right there with me, but it's so interesting because I remember so clearly how powerful that was even now, like the power of thought and prayer and intention and it calmed yeah. him down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is something I have all of my um, clients who come in work on and we identify which specific strategies are going to work best for them. And it's something that's so overlooked and I overlooked it. Even having done research in it, I was like, well, I can do a couple breathing practices. And I had been a yoga therapist, so I know how to breathe. I know how to do yoga, but it wasn't enough. And I had to really beef that up. And I'd had some childhood traumas and some major stressors as a child. And it made the world of difference. It was the missing piece. It's like I had all the foods right. It was the right. Multiple pots. I had the supplements right. But I tell people now it's 50% of the healing process is we've got to calm the nervous system because of that interconnection there with the mast cells. Yeah. So what do you start with? Do you have a program? Do you have a handout? Do you have a, like, what, how do you, how do people get to know more about this or, or see you yeah. for it? Or what would you recommend for people listening? Well, we did a whole blog on kind of the background. Mm -hmm. And one of the programs I really love people to do Gupta program or DNRS, one of those that appeals to them. So that helps with the limbic system, mm -hmm. the fear and emotion part of the nervous system. Then we have to work on the structural part of the vagal nerve and we have to work on the signaling, the nerve signaling. And so there's some different things with that that I'm gonna really get into to help people decide which ones are right for them. So we're gonna do that in um, a, a class that I've got coming up. So I'm trying okay. to put together these online classes so people have access to some lower cost offerings. It's not everybody can afford to work with somebody like you or me, it's expensive and then that way they can step themselves through and then take it to their practitioner too. Oh, how exciting. Well, you'll be sure and share that because we will share it with everybody. That's uh, super exciting and super practical. So, um, so start with the nervous system. Totally couldn't agree more as I got into mold and Lyme and the infections and I'm definitely doing MCAS in my practice because yeah. it's so prevalent. Mm -hmm. It's not my number one focus, but it's really there as a number one thing. But what I was going to say is what I realized, just like you mentioned, is I can't really heal those infections and toxins until I address the limbic system and this overactivation. So right. um, I love that. A couple of things that I've learned. Um, so the DNRS, you mentioned the Gupta program, fantastic way to start. Um, there's a book called um, How to Heal the Vagus Nerve, I believe, that I've recommended to patients. And then there's a couple of things, I think, passively. So if you're a type A like me and you get one more program to do, there's a little bit of it that's like feels like, oh, no, one more thing I have to do, right? And so then for me, that stresses me out. So I wanted to have, include some passive things. And I found biurnal beats, just listening to these changes yeah. in hurts can be really calming to the nervous system and I if I go on my walk often I'll put on my headphones and listen to those um, and then uh, cranial sacral therapy or integrative manual physical therapy some of these therapists that really work with the nervous system and I like that because if you just want to go and receive if you're all stressed out it's some other options in there that you can do to help with that nervous system well and it's so wonderful too because when you've been chronically ill and as sick as you and I have been and as probably a lot of people listening have been then you start to feel not safe in your own body. It just doesn't feel like a safe place to be. And you can't get an escape from yeah, it. Exactly. So to have somebody just hold you and hold that space and help you feel safe in your own body is huge. Yeah. So I love cranial sacral as well, exactly for that reason. Yeah. 
Exactly. And then there's certain actual points that I'm going to teach in that class that people can work with. And that's a free, easy thing that people can do as well to help calm the nervous system. I love that. So let's talk about, I mean, there are some great supplements out there and things. Uh, do you start with meds? Do you start with supplements? What's kind of the approach of the direction of treating this once you get the nervous system a little bit under control? Yeah, it depends on how um, ill people are, how reactive they are, and if they're functional or not. So I see a lot of people that just aren't functioning. They're barely making it through their day if they can work or they can't work. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes meds are necessary, but the GI symptoms, I found that often cromlin sodium is a game changer. Sometimes people can do catodafin and that can help calm things down. Sometimes some H1 and H2 mm -hmm. blockers, especially if there's massive sleep issues, people just can't sleep at all. Sometimes something like hydroxazine can kind of break that cycle. So those are some options on that side. And then sometimes people aren't tolerating those meds. And one of the problems is other than cromlin sodium, and then catodafin, of course, has to be compounded here in the U.S., but all of the other mast cell stabilizing and antihistamine medications have mast cell triggers in the inactive ingredients like titanium dioxide or these colors. So many times people think they're reacting to the med, but they're reacting to that. So trying something compounded that's really clean can help. And then on the supplement side, I love, so my top two are perilla seed extract and then the bakelin, the Chinese skull cap extract. And the perilla seed extract is so gentle. And I've found most people tolerate it, but I've got so many super sensitive people. I don't have a single thing everybody can do. Yeah. Even baking soda and water, I have people, some people that can't uh -huh. do it. So I never say like everybody, yeah. you know, can do something. But, and then that, Bakel and Chinese skull cap extract not only supports mast cell calming, but it has an effect on the nervous system too, and that nervous system calming. So those are usually the first two I'll try with people. And baking soda, baking mm -hmm. soda and water on an empty stomach. There's something, maybe you know the action. I know that when we go into flares, sodium yeah. dumps out of the body. So if somebody doesn't have the high blood pressure, they can try the baking soda. There's something with the bicarbonate that I have not found a mechanism for. Do you, do you know? I that? wonder, I don't know for sure, but I wonder it's similar to the Alka-Seltzer Gold, which is a very chemical version of that. It'd be like the similar, that if someone's having a really bad Herxin sensitivity, which is probably mast cell, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's like magic. It's like this wet blanket on the system. And I think it's because it alkalinizes the system pretty immediately. And when you turn from acidic to alkaline, everything changes and shifts enzymatically. So I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing that the alkalinity shifts the mast cell in some way. And I wonder now with some of these herbs and things that we use, the two you mentioned, I love skull cap. I have not used the perilla seed. So that's a real, that's a game changer to know that from you. Um, and of course like quercetin and those, but those can have their other issues. But I wonder if some of those herbs actually have a more alkaline effect too. It's, it'd be interesting to see. Yeah, what. I, I do have the studies on how they um, affect the receptors. Ah, okay. And excellent. One of the things that's so fascinating to me about mast cells is they have over a thousand mediators yeah. and then hundreds of receptors on the outside. So they can respond to so many different things. And that's part of what makes them perfect for that kind of frontline sense uh -huh. of the cell, but also why we often need this multifactorial approach. It's not simple because they're, those cells are complex and then this whole condition is very complex. Oh, that's great. And then, so you've really given us a great overview. Um, do you find, I find just hydration and water and IV fluids can be game changers as silly as that sounds, probably along the lines of the alkalinity because water is the most natural antihistamine out there. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so funny because people are usually pretty well educated by the time they find me. They've done a lot of reading. They've tried a lot of things. And I'd say about 25% of people that when I do a case review, they're not drinking enough water. And they just haven't thought about that. So they're trying, they're getting like two cups of water in a day. Yeah. And yeah like really it. <laughs> need to do like at least half of our body weight analysis. I do a gallon a day just because I'm naturally thirsty. 
probably because of the, I'm still on right. the table. <laughs> Me too. I'm just encouraged because I do decent, but I need to do more. So <laughs> that's an encouragement. So we talk supplements, um, targeted binders. Okay. This is a little shift because um, this is more related to mold, but any sort of trigger that could be a toxin. You did some work recently with Emily Gibbler and Neil Nathan on the targets of uh, the binders and stuff. I'd love to hear a little bit about your research there and what you found. Yeah, for sure. Well, when we're talking about kind of big picture order of operations, so we've got nervous system, we've got mast cell calming, and then if there's mold toxicity, that's absolutely step three. Mm -hmm. it, no matter what else is happening, unless it's, of course, acute or an emergency issue, we've got to deal with the mold toxicity. And where we start is elimination, right? So we start with making sure we're having good bowel movements, drinking enough water. You've got this amazing coffee enema kit where you actually got me to try it for the first time because I had been intimidated and afraid to try it, but your kit made it so easy. So we have those steps and then we bring the binders in. Now, I, I always wanna be really transparent. I did the phase two detox research. I didn't do the binder research, but we know now that there are specific binders that have more affinity to specific mold toxins and we can really make this quite a bit more targeted. So for example, like charcoal is often used for mold toxins and it's a great binder for things like okra toxin and it's a great binder for trichothecenes, but it doesn't really bind gliotoxin. Mm -hmm. So what do we use for that? Well, we can use Saccharomyces boulardii actually binds gliotoxin, which I find really fascinating. And then N-acetylcysteine will bind gliotoxin. I don't have a lot of people in my practice that can take that because they're very sensitive and they usually have iron dysregulation and there's a problem that can happen there. Um, but it is a binder. And then uh, another great one for gliotoxin is chlorella. Uh, and so, no, chlorella is aflatoxin. So we have the Saccharomyces, we have the um, bentonite clay uh -huh. for the gliotoxin. So it's like we can really hone this in and I'm getting so much better outcomes with that information. Yeah, this is fantastic. And I don't know if you have any, do you have that up on your, I know Dr. Nathan has it, I think on his website and do you have it on yours as well where people could find? I did, I made a really big blog post. It's a lot of info but I wanted to show people the whole overview so that you can step yourself through. So it really has, it's like this talks in these binders, this talks in these binders, and then the phase two supports, and then just shows how you need to go through stage by stage by stage. And then oh. the antifungals and the biofilm at the end. So be sure and share that with me, email, text, whatever. I'll make sure it's on here. So you guys listening, I'll make sure it's on your YouTube and I'll make sure that it is um, shared with all my listeners because that's just a, such a great resource that you always put together. I know I as a clinician will be, what you know, I've, I've known a lot of the nuances, but it's so nice to have it in one place. Um, so thanks for all your work on that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so after the mold, uh, what else would you say? What, what are the, is there any other order of things or things that we're missing on the um, healing these patients, helping them to heal? Yeah. So, well, one thing that keeps popping in my head that when we talked about symptoms, we didn't talk about, and we need to weave it back in for a second, is autoimmunity. Yeah. And mast cells are often kind of the base of autoimmunity. So once people have mast cell activation, there's so much more predisposition towards autoimmune conditions because we get that increased chronic inflammation that teach to response and then that can take us over into autoimmunity so if somebody has autoimmunity they almost every autoimmune condition has been linked in the research to mass cell activation so something to think about and we know mold toxins are a big trigger of that too and then in terms of after that i have this image that i like to use of one of those jenga games yeah and with the blocks and the bottom block in this image, there's only one block on the bottom and it says mold. Uh -huh. And then if we pull that out, part of the tower is going to fall down. And then we see what's left because yeah. the mold toxins are going to dysregulate our hormone balance or methylation. The gut is so hard to address SIBO mm -hmm. or SIFO when we've got mold toxins that haven't been addressed. But generally, I, in the mold toxin protocol, when we get to the antimicrobial phase, then I like to start weaving in the gut supports if there's dysbiosis or SIBO or CFO, start to work with that. And if somebody does have active Lyme, Bartonella, then I'll refer them to um, somebody that really works with Lyme because I 
have my area, but that's yeah. not a place. So I'll refer to somebody like you or um, somebody in their area that can help them with that piece. And then we can start on things like the hormone balancing, see if there are still methylation issues. All along the way, I'm working with people on their foods. And so I really encourage people to do low histamine and a low lectin trial. And because lectins trigger mast cells and they actually have what's called a C-type lectin receptor for mold and fun other fungal species that also these lectin foods like potatoes and corn and wheat can trigger and even our squashes like butternut squash, unfortunately. But I have them do that for six to eight weeks, see what calms down. And then not everybody has histamine intolerance though with mass activation. So if it doesn't make any difference, then we might ditch it. But for most people, I see that it makes a difference. We might have to work with the oxalates, but that's got to yeah. be, that's a little tricky. People it is when you throw all the, so I love that you said that. And I want to talk just a little specific. So if you're listening, you were like, well, what histamine foods? My own experience was before there was lots of blogs on histamine. And I remember being like bone broth. Everybody says it's good, but I don't do well on it. Uh, kombucha. Everybody says it's good, but I do horrible on it. Uh, fermented foods. They're supposed to be good for your gut, but I don't do well. on it. So of course, this is a list of histamine containing foods. And clearly I had histamine issues, but I was like, why in the world? These are good foods. So, and they are good foods for some people. But it's funny because things like bone broth, things like especially collagenous bone broth, things like um, anything fermented, um, any sort of like those jerky bars that are so popular with the paleo diets, any sort of meat or protein that's been um, aged or fermented or dried. Uh, so you might be surprised at some of these supposedly good foods. And then lectins, you mentioned a few. Um, is there any other like um, common lectins that people might, might not be aware of? Because they're pretty common. Yeah, well, gosh, corn's a big one. And I had, even after I could walk and my joints were better, I was still having joint burning. And I finally realized it was the corn and the butternut squash. Oh. So those are some big ones. Anything in the nightshade family. So the eggplants, the tomatoes, um, sunflower seeds, mm -hmm. so cucumbers even. But if you peel and seed the cucumbers, that's going to take it down. Okay. And I think that's a, a key for people to look at. I have the same problem with the histamines. My, I, when I'm into something, I'm all in. So my yeah. <laughs> laboratory with my kombucha and uh -huh. my <laughs> cultured veggies and everything happening. And I was just itching head to toe and I couldn't sleep. Yeah. And that's what led me to the histamine intolerance. Oh, that's, but that's we just did a whole thing on these unhealthy foods. Uh-huh. And that aren't healthy if you have mast cell activation or histamine intolerance. And oh, that's a good one because I feel all the time they're so proud of their bone broth or kombucha and they have yeah. histamine issues. And I'm like, oh, sorry, those are not going to go so well. But there be, I mean, because it's not really out there um, public, I mean, it is out there with your information in mind, but not as common because people just think of them as health, like bone broth. It's like this, you right. know. Or celery juice is a big one. But yes. Celery yes. juice, when you get to 16 ounces of celery yes. juice, really, really high oxalate. And I have people come in and they're having yes. terrible urinary burning and joint pain and it's that celery juice. So, but you have to step it down slow. You don't want to stop those oxalates cold turkey. Okay. This is really important. So I'm so glad. And green juices and things, a lot of kales and spinaches and things have higher oxalates, especially spinach. So blueberries, spinach, almonds, these wonderful foods. I remember maybe it 12 months ago, I tried something with more almond flour and then I was eating it regularly. And also my lips got really dry and broken out. And it was, I'm sure it was oxalates because it was, but um, these are, oxalates are good foods. They're amazingly healthy foods. So you're, you do have to sometimes take those. And like Beth said, you maybe start with the lectins and the histamine and don't worry so much about oxalates. But what you mentioned, I wanted to reiterate is that if you do think you have oxalate issues, you don't want to go from hundred miles an hour to zero in one day because you will dump oxalate oxalates and you will it's very very painful you'll actually flare and it's not good so it's pretty important if you do think you have oxalate issues to diminish the level um, and I always say, you know, you're going to have to kind of titrate so that you have a pretty normal level every day, a lower level maybe than what you used to, but you don't necessarily want to go zero oxalates and you also don't want to go down quickly. Right. And I, I think um, most people, if they have an oxalate issue, they can just worry about the big five, the beets, the spinach, the Swiss chard, rhubarb, almonds. I think I covered spinach. Um, those are the major ones. But the other thing I want to tell people is that these often aren't for life. So yeah. yes, I've gotten so much more histamine intolerance. I can have a fourth of an avocado, which is so amazing now. Yeah. 
And I can have small amounts of some of these foods. And often when we address the mold and we heal the gut, we get much more oxalate tolerance back. We may not be eating sweet potatoes every day, but we can really improve our ability to handle those foods. I so love that because we get these people that I always say, it's like your box is getting smaller and smaller and you come in with four foods that you can eat and you still can't eat those every day. So you're really, really limited. And I'm always like, first thing when I think of that is of course mast cell and mold because they will make the box smaller. You're going to be more sensitive. And part of this is because oxalates, histamine, mold, and many other things, but those are huge ones, will all increase your intestinal permeability. So all of a sudden you have Swiss cheese for guts and you have these holes all over in your gut and then everything you're eating goes right into the bloodstream and creates more you know, antigenic effect. So um, part of it is uh, you can have healing. I'm like you. I used to be on you know, maybe 10 foods. And now I can be, I'm still very strict with my diet, but I can eat a lot like grains. I used to not be able to touch any grains. I can eat quinoa and a little bit of white rice if I need to, no problem at all. And that was not tolerable before. So a lot of times your box is getting smaller and our job, Beth and I, we don't want to make your box any smaller, but temporarily while you're healing, you might pull that in and be very restrictive so that you can lower that histamine load and inflammation. And then our goal is to expand that box for you. Yeah, exactly. And I tell people, if you at all can, think about replacing, not removing. Yes. So let's replace spinach and cur let's replace spinach with curly kale with things like the flat leaf kale. Arugula is a huge superfood for people with mast cell issues. There's just so many. Oh, great I love that. And I love, I did not know that the curly kale, for some reason I gravitate towards the dinosaur, the flat kale, but I yeah. didn't know the curly is more histamine. Is that right? Or more, no, um, more oxalates. Oxalate. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, gosh, I could talk to you forever, Beth. <laughs> this has been so fun. Um, I would love to make sure people know we talked about your website, but where can they find you and um, how can they get involved and know when your course is coming out? Oh, thank you, Jill. So we've got a website at masscell360.com and it's M as in Mary, A S T as in Tom, C E L L 360.com. We've got a great Facebook community as well. And we do free Facebook lives for people, something different about mass activation every week. Awesome. Um, if people are ready to jump in, I've got a free root causes report where people can get more in depth because there was no way to cover them all today, the but they can start to check off what they think they have and make sure it's being addressed. We've got a supplements class in mass activation and our nervous system class is going to happen November 2nd. So, or sorry, November 10th. So if people get on the email list, they'll get all of that info. Well, thank you for all the wonderful resources you provide and just all your work. And I know it comes, I just want to acknowledge like, this comes from a very deep level of your suffering and your overcoming. And I love that you've used that to catapult you into being an expert in this. And um, even today, all the listeners, and I'm sure we're going to have many more than all that you're doing. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Beth, for the great work that you're doing. Thank you. And I just love that we can team up like this and really help people not have to suffer like we had to. Exactly. Exactly. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, this will be live recorded and then it'll be on the YouTube channel. So we hope to see you at an upcoming Facebook live soon. Take care.